Why do we use these frameworks? View, Angular, and React manages data to keep it in sync. We just focus on the app data stored in memory and place it in the front end. These frameworks will keep the data in sync. If the app data changes, it will update the user interface. However, if the user updates the front end, it will update the application data. So everything will be kept in sync. Also, they allow us to break down our app into modular pieces called components. Components are bricks, and we join them together to make the entire application or building. For example, the Tuts Plus website can be broken down into smaller pieces. I could have a component repeated for each lecture in the course. All components must have template code and app data, and CSS styles are optional. Components can be nested inside of other components. They can also communicate with one another. Parent components pass data down to the child component. Child components can pass data up to the parent by using events. We have higher order components that act like pages, hence their higher order of importance. We only have one page in the browser being loaded, but we can change the component being rendered to look like pages in our app. Using the HTML5 history API, the router can use the browser's back and forward buttons to navigate the components. It works with the URL, so we can navigate our higher order components just like regular pages. We can also pass parameter data, like for example, a contact ID. When I pass a different contact ID, it'll change the contact being rendered. Next, we have the Flux architecture. For large scale apps, scattering our data across multiple components is hard to debug. The Flux architecture will place all app data in one place. Then, when it's updated, we update the entire app state. Just like a shock wave, updating all relevant components through our entire app. To keep track of all modifications, we have a dispatcher, actions, and reducers. Components use the dispatcher to trigger actions. The dispatcher will note the component and data passed for debugging. The action will invoke the relevant reducer or multiple reducers. In this case, it'll invoke two reducers. Actions can also invoke other actions as well. The reducers are there to perform one modification. Each reducer will be logged so we can see each modification to the app state. For each change in the application state, our app is fluxed to reflect the data. Also, all the debugging information is in one place for simplicity. The store wraps the state, reducer, and actions together. It's like a shopping store for all your app data needs. There are two types of application state mutable and immutable. In the case of view, it is mutable, meaning mutatable. This means we only have one app state object and we just modify the properties that we need. Immutable is not mutatable. We must replace the state each time with a new one. Immutable reducers will copy the state object, modify it and reassign it for each reducer that's invoked. Both have their advantages. Mutable states have less overhead as we're using the same state object and modifying only the bits we need. However, to do this, Vue needs to deep link, watching all properties and watching out for new properties, which has a performance impact. Immutable, however, is still more overhead because we replace the entire state each time. However, there is no need for deep linking, so it is still performant. Also, from a debugging standpoint, it is rather good. I can see the entire state with each modification. It's almost like a time machine stepping backwards through the app state at that point in time. Modules are configurations. For example, if I wanted to define a router, I would make this a module. Also, to define a flux store with the state, reducers, and actions, I would make this a module also. Modules are not visible to the user, unlike components. Modules are pure app logic. These frameworks all utilize the CLI or command line interface. It's just a console window available on Mac, 
GNU and Windows. The command line is the builder. It'll take all our modular code such as our components and modules and stick them together to make the entire app. Also, we can take advantage of Jade, SAS, SCSS, ES7, or TypeScript when developing our components or modules. When exported, the command line will convert Jade to HTML, SAS or SCSS to CSS, and TypeScript or JavaScript ES6 to JavaScript ES5, making our app compatible with older browsers. Let's take a look at some of the benefits of ES6 or TypeScript. Objects can now define methods by typing the key name with parentheses and braces. It can also import variables by using the variable's name as the key name and assign the value. This will be the equivalent in ES5. See how ES6's syntax is clearer. Arrow functions are defined by parentheses and braces, instead of defining it as a regular function. Arrow functions are nice with inline functions, for example, set timeout. Classes are constructors. They create objects from the class members. Class members are properties and methods. When we invoke the class, just like a constructor function, we are creating an object. Classes also make it easy to extend from other classes. For example, we can have our car component class extending the reacts component class. When invoking the car class, we'll build one object combining both properties from both classes. Each time we invoke the car class, we have a car instance. An instance is the object copy from the class blueprint. It's important to note all methods are stored in a prototype object. Think of the car class as a car factory producing cars. Each car is an instance. The prototype object is shared between all instances or car objects. That's because the properties are unique. They can have different colors, engine sizes, and more. However, the drive, reverse, and part methods are not unique to a car object. So why bother copying these methods for each instance taking up memory? Instead, when you invoke the drive method on any one of the car instances, it will look for the key name drive. It won't find it on the instance level, so it goes down to the prototype object. Essentially, a prototype object is a shared object. Now let's take a look at modularity in ES6, which these frameworks heavily utilize. Think of exporting just like you would in the real world, where you have shipping containers that are exported and then we dock them by importing them into that dock. Well, likewise, we have this with modularity. We export a value or member. That member could be a variable, it could be a function, it could be an object, it could be an array, it could be anything and any value you want to export. And this value can be imported and selected later on in the application timeline. To import the default member, just type import and then the variable name that'll store the default exported member, whether that be an object, array, or anything else. This is just a variable name and you can give it any name you'd like. However, for named members, they need to go into braces. The braces contain the name of the exported member, such as the exported variable name, function name, or class name. Let's now import each one of those members by their name, adding in the braces and then separating each name via a comma. Finally, you need to say where to import these members from. Point to the module file you want to load in the string. Always leave out the file extension. All members are optional. For example, I can just import the car class member, allowing me to load only what I need from the module. You can think of TypeScript as JavaScript ES6 that's type safe. And what type 
are we talking about? The type of data, such as number, string, boolean, or any other sort of value. Interfaces allow you to check the structure of an object to make sure it matches. You can define property names, and you also define the type of value that property contains. You can also define methods. You can define the parameter names and also the data types that are assigned to those parameters. You can also define the return type of the method. If for any reason the object doesn't match up with the interface exactly in terms of property, property value types and also methods, it will error and tell you that it's not type safe. All these frameworks use RxJS under the hood. RxJS is where we observe any data from JS or a web service and detect any changes to the properties. The observable object is not the data itself, it's just looking for new data. To describe the observable, it will be like your YouTube account. It provides a service to watch data, the data being new YouTube videos from that channel being released. We can watch these channels or channel data by subscribing to them. So the observable is not the data itself, it's just providing the subscribe button to the channel data. The channel data is the data we want to observe. The RxJS observable can have three subroutines to execute. Next, error or complete. The next method will run whenever the data we're watching changes. This could be an object, an array, or just simply a number or a string. In this case, we could use the example of a new YouTube video being uploaded, providing new channel data. If the data errors for some reason, then it will run the error method on the observable. Just like with YouTube, you can subscribe, watch, and unsubscribe stop watching the channel data. On complete, however, will destroy the observable object that watches the data. RxJS has another functionality, which is converting DOM strings to their actual representation of JavaScript objects. For example, we have a simple div DOM string, but this isn't what it looks like in memory to JavaScript. It turns this simple DOM string into a JavaScript object. This JavaScript object acts like a representative to the DOM string or structure. This object provides all the information, the attribute data and the styling data that could be applied to this specific element. An RxJS just allows us to type in the DOM string very quickly and have that converted into a JavaScript object, making it easier for us to create a DOM structure that's actually represented by JavaScript objects. Let's tie everything together. Our components have template data that RxJS will convert into JavaScript objects. There is only one root element per component, and you can have as many child elements as you'd like. Next, we have our class, which will export the properties for each component, and export all methods and other functionality into a prototype object, or shared object. Now, each instance or copy of the component can have different property values. If the user changes the data, the app data will change. Vice versa, if the app data changes, the user interface changes. And we also use ES6 modularity to export components and import components into other components. And we can create our entire app structure via the modularity, breaking our application down into smaller pieces so we can focus on editing that one little piece of our application. And we have a very large application when we compile everything together through that all important terminal. This fast paced video will really get you up to speed with all of those famous frameworks.